Perfect. Okay, so I was looking at your campaign website, mm -hmm. and I was looking through some of the issues that you're passionate about. And I fell on your LGBTQ plus issues page, and the first topic I want to talk to you about is this diversity training mm -hmm. with state employees that the Yunkin administration has been rolling out. I know the Virginia Mercury did a story on this. What are you hearing from state employees, and what do you think about the diversity training? Well, at first, you know, that when I wrote that bill, my intention was to help state employees to become more knowledgeable about not only the different cultures, but actually I was targeting LGBTQ, you know, individuals that were coming to the state to be served. I actually, I came out with that bill because one of my constituents went to the DMV and he was identifying as a female and the DMV didn't want to help them because that was not the gender at birth. So mom called me, you know, in tears, look what's happening. And I said, that's the law. You have to put what they said they wanted to be. So I had to get involved. And then I realized by talking to the commissioner and talking to the employees who work at the DMV that they need to understand where individuals come from. And they, as part of their job, you know, to help all Virginians, including the LGBTQ community, and we need to understand their rights and their identities. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, while the bill went to the state Senate, then we realized that there was not even a uh, cultural competence training. And so we turned that into cultural competence and make that training broader. And I haven't heard anything that people push back as far as state employees. What I've heard is good feedback because they, many of them did they know, for example, the amount of languages that are spoken in Virginia, or the amount of communities that live in Virginia. So the state employees are excited about it and grateful that now they have that opportunity to be trained, but at the same time learn. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the, um, let me pull this up here. It's coming. All right, here we go. So another issue I have seen on your website uh, that you introduced and you're continuing to work on legislation to expand the definition of child abuse to include bullying a child based on gender identity or sexual orientation. What compelled you to introduce this legislation and continue to work on this? Well, I'm a social worker, you know, and I've seen firsthand the lack of resources and support systems for children, LGBTQ children, and their parents as well. So we, when I was reading the law, and I have worked in child protective services as well, and we help all children. However, we have failed to, I, to state that bullying against children from an LGBTQ community for their gender identity or sexual orientation is not included as part of the code. Unfortunately, you know, the bill was laid on the table because we spoke uh, with the Department of Social Services then and they didn't have the capacity to absorb the amount of issues that could come, but promised me that they will work on the issue. But living in the times that we are living now with Governor Jankin forcing children, you know, to be out, you know, and expose them to their parents and reading articles where children are in tears and, you know, afraid of what could happen to them, I think there are articles in the Washington Post where even children are like, well, if my parents know, they won't help me to go to college. They'll pick me up. So I think that is wrong, you know, and I just want those children to know that Delegate Guzman is here to help them. I haven't forgotten about them, that I will continue to fight for this legislation. And I think that it's extremely necessary in the times that we are living now. Uh, it's extremely important. So will you be reintroducing this bill come this general assembly yes, session? Yes, we are having policy conversations right now with the House Democratic Caucus, and we are having those conversations now. But the day that Governor Jankin wanted to implement this policy, I immediately texted the policy lead on that committee. I said, this is how we're going to push back. If he wants to do that, when then we have to also protect children. So why don't we do, you know, for children's being abused, 
do that a CPS charge and we can implement that as well to give you support that. So we are still having conversations, but yes, I'm happy to reintroduce it. And for clarity, when you said the moment that the governor introduced his policy, are you talking about the uh, revisions to the model policies yes. with the VDOE? Okay. Um, and so you're still a social worker, right? Mm -hmm. From a social worker's perspective, we'll start with this question. What's the importance for, in your view, to have affirming parents uh, especially with students of LGBTQ backgrounds? Well, I think that it's extremely important because as a mom of four children, we all love our children. But we, love, we need to love them for who they are and where they are coming from. And sometimes it's ignorance, to be honest with you, just to understand uh, where children come from. So I believe that as a social worker, my job is, when, I'm fa when I am dealing with these cases, is to help her to number one, accept their children, to become more knowledgeable about the issue, and most importantly, to become a support system for their children, because they need to realize that when they, if they are bullied, if they are mistreated, there are not systems in place right now in Virginia. For example, if you are homeless, you leave your house or wherever you are living, you know, there are not shelters in place that would place them right now in a place for the identity that they, they have now so they are we only have female ro rooms we have male rooms bathrooms but we don't have that for transgender uh, individuals mm -hmm. so that's something that we need to address but I think that we have to help them to become a support system I think parents love their children I so as much as I love mine and I need to help them mm -hmm. and flipping the question around as a social worker what do you think about parents who might not be affirming or just are not affirming, period, when it comes to uh, the sexual orientation or gender identity of their children? I think that as a parent, we always want to be there for our children, you know, and I've seen cases where children, you know, have left their homes because they didn't feel that they are supported or they are hurt. So they go and I've heard, I've seen stories of children who are homeless and they even the case of one of my constituents who actually she went to a hospital and she had to sell her blood because she didn't have support systems. And I, what I'll do with them is talk to them about the cases that I have seen and what would happen to their children and I'm sure they will be able to listen and accept them. So I was looking at, I read your bill that you introduced in 2020 and it expands the definition of abuse and neglect mm -hmm. to include affirmation yeah. um, or non-affirming mm -hmm. parents of gender identity and sexual orientation. So uh, coming at this with a perspective of, of a social worker, are you saying non-affirming parents are committing abuse against their children if they don't affirm their gender identity or sexual orientation? I know, I'm not saying that. Where I come from a place is that they need to learn. If that's something that they have not been dealing with, and this is the first case, the first case within their community, what I wanted to do is help them. So I want them to be able to see the state as a resource or their local government, so where they can call and ask for help. And that happens all the time, even when we talk about other, you know, abuse. You know, there I was also a child advocate where I helped children, you know, coming from neglect and abuse. And, you know, my intention was not to come after parents. My intention was to listen to all sides and come with a conclusion of how can we help the child, but also help parents uh, as well. And I, I was the ears and eyes for the judge. So I needed to come and submit my report to them. But I've never, as a social worker, I cannot be biased on it, any side. My role is to come and listen to both sides and help them both succeed. The child as a child for who they are or who they love and the parent to become a better parent. So how does this bill, if it was passed, signed into law, how does it work kind of in practice? Let's say, because how I understand it, and just correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. if let's say there is a child who might be in the LGBT commu commu community and they find that they're in a situation where their parents don't support them, do not affirm their gender identity or sexual orientation, do they kind of, do they report that to a school official or 
a court reporter or a social worker, and then Child Protective Services or a government agent, agency launches an investigation to see what it's all about. Is that kind of how it works in practice, or is it something else that you have in mind? Sure. So we have a list of mandated reporters, and among mandated reporters, we have the school staff, you know, an adult who is a social worker or some, a counselor in the school. So we have to look at the list of mandated reporters. And if this child shares with those mandated reporters what they are going through, and we're talking about not only physical abuse, but we're talking mental abuse, what the job of that mandated reporter is to inform Child Protective Services. And then that's how everybody gets involved. And there's an investigation also in place that is not only, you know, from a social worker, but there's also a police investigation before we make the decision that there's going to be a CPS charge. Okay. Um, what is, what, how do you define affirmation in terms of, and the scope of this bill? Well, uh, you know, I'm not an attorney. You know, I come from a place where I'm trying to help, you know, children and the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. So what I want, what my goal of the bill is to accept children for who they are. So I'm not uh, getting into the nitty gritty of that word, but the, the, core, the scope of the bill, which is to help children, you know, accept them for who they are and help parents to become a support system, more than affirmation or anything else. And I was just trying to think, do you think this infringes on free speech or religious freedom at all? Because there might be some people in community of different faiths, whether it's the Muslim faith or Catholic faith, who, because of their religious beliefs, they don't believe in affirmation of LGBTQ issues when it comes to their children. What do you tell those parents um, who might be learning about this bill, who don't feel like they want to necessarily affirm uh, what their children are feeling when it comes to their sexual orientation or gender identity? I would tell you that I've been asked that question multiple times by knocking on doors, as I represent a very competitive scene. And I, I'm a religious person myself, and I go by what the Bible said, and that said that we have to love everyone, and it is not our job to judge anyone. You know, that is a business between that individual and God. And what the Bible said is that we have to love everyone, that neighbor, for who they are. So that's what I tell them when they ask me that question. And that's what I will continue to tell people in faith. You know, we all have you know, a commitment with God. And that commitment belongs to two people, God and that person. You know, as parents, we are there to orient our children, to guide them you know, and tell them what they should do. But at the end of the day, we all are going to become adults. And for those believers out there, we know that there is life after life. And there is going to be a conversation between that person and God. And that's what we have to go by, what the Bible says. You know, it is not my job to judge anyone. It is my job to help people. But I know that I'll be responsible for what I do as a person after I die. And that's something between God and I. In 10 seconds, or 15 seconds, <laughs> How, what would you say, what does your bill do? What would it do? My bill will state in the Code of Virginia that bullying a child from the LGBTQ community, and this includes mental or physical abuse, to be abused for their sexual orientation or gender identity, that would be considered a, CPS, a child protective services charge. And what could the penalties be if you know the investigation concludes and it's concluded that a parent is not affirming of their lgbtq child what could the consequences be well we first have to have an investigation you know and before we make the determination that there's going to be a cps charge depending on the type of abuse and this is for all abuse not only lgbtq you know it could be a felony it could be a misdemeanor but we know that CP a cps charge could harm you know your employment could harm your education because nowadays many people uh, have those they do a cps database search before offering employment however you know there's an investigation it's not something that happens overnight there are too many people involved before we come up with that decision i've heard from some republicans oh 
Keep going. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll let, we'll let Brian and I'll ask the question. Um, are you all set? Just about. But you can go ahead and do it. This is going to be a fun creative shot. <laughs> are you ready? Yeah. What would you tell your Republican colleagues who say this is criminalizing parents? What would you tell them? No, it's not. It's educating parents because the law tells you the do's and don'ts. So this law is telling you, do not abuse your children because they are LGBTQ. So what we do is, and we, I would tell also my colleagues that we are here to represent Democrats, Republicans when we are elected, and we need, we are here to represent also members of the LGBTQ community. And our job is to treat all of our constituency with dignity and respect, and that includes the LGBTQ children. And this legislation is coming at a time when we have seen what some call parents' rights and what some call LGBTQ protections. We're, we're just seeing that consume Virginia politics right now. Everyone's talking about it. We saw students walk out of the classroom across the state of Virginia and protested the governor's new proposed model policies on the treatment of transgender students. And you see the governor saying what he says about the different issues. I know he had like a Parents Matter rally in Annandale and Fairfax County, I think a month and a half or two months ago. Mm -hmm. Just what are your overall thoughts about the rhetoric uh, and the focus on these topics? What are, what are your thoughts as a social worker and as a lawmaker? Well, I would say that as a social worker, I would commend these children for speaking out and standing up for what is, for what is right. You know, they are, for those who are not in the LGBTQ community, we saw, you know, males and females coming out with their LGBTQ uh, classmates. And I think that is extremely important that we show that as a community, we are ready to accept each other for who they are and who they love. And uh, this is not a bill that will, you know, agitate parents because we haven't seen any parents to come against it. So I think that tells you that as parents, we also want to be there for our children. Anything else you'd like to add? No. Did no. we cover it? Uh, what do you think about Governor Yunkin's stance on, on a lot of these different education issues? Well, you know, I would say that Governor Yunkin is cherry picking on issues and the education system, you know, that and highlighting the needs that have been addressed in the past. This is not something new to us. We know that currently, for example, we need $365 million to put Virginia to become the number one on a public education. So my ask to Governor Jankin is that he really believes in public education I would ask them to, now that Virginia is in a good place, you know, uh, that we could invest these $365 million that are needed to, to have the number one public education system for our children. But we have made, you know, great accomplishments in public education. We have invested the last two years in early childhood education, in more school counselors, in creating the G3 program, that will provide two years of free college for students that wanted to go into the health field on IT and technology. But we understand that there was so much to do. So I'm asking Governor Yankin today that Virginia is in a good place and, uh, and what we want is to invest those extra dollars that we have in public education so we can work together on helping Virginia to become the number one school system in the country. Awesome.